Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Season 2 of Horrible History with Asher Brooks. My name is Asher Brooks. This is my show. And you are hearing it on our wonderful new equipment, which was very expensive. So I hope I sound good. Um, Joining me in sounding good is my wonderful guest today, a young lady named Kay Dragon, who is the curator Mm -hmm. of the Maritime Museum here in Sturgeon Bay, which is a place that I live. Please don't come find me. Um, But... She's an actual historian, actual museum person, so probably the most qualified person I've ever had on the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Many degrees. You have many degrees. How many degrees do you have? Uh, Total? Yes. Three. You have three? Two bachelors and a master's. Mm, I don't have any of those things. I have a bachelor's Bachelor's degree. degree. I have a bachelor's degree. I have a bachelor's degree in clown, in theater. Oh, Lord. But that's that's not like a real degree. We did a lot of movement work. I don't I don't necessarily think I have an academic degree, but um well we are here, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about duels. Our first episode, the season premiere is gonna be about duels. Um I've got a lot of wonderful duels queued up. And now that we're getting started, I realize I didn't ask you at all how you wanted to structure this. So I have no idea. Fantastic. How many duels have you brought? I have two. You have two? One international and one pure blood American. <laughs> pure blood pure blood American. <laughs> This duel brought to you by Ford. <laughs> by <a> truck. <laughs> truck month. <laughs> truck month. This duel sponsored by Toyota Thon. Happy Honda Days. Shoot somebody. Um, I have, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven. Some of them are very short, though. Okay. Some of them are very short. So we'll start with a couple of mine um, that I think will be a lot of fun. Uh, so, uh, I guess just to top us off, have you ever been in a fight, Kay? Yes. How many fights have you been in? Two. Two. Did you win? Uh, one of them I don't remember, because I was in middle school. Okay. The second one was a bar fight. You were in a bar fight? Uh-huh. In a sketchy-ass bar uh, back home. I ended up actually breaking up said fight, because my roommate uh, got started, got it started, and I had to drag her tiny Filipino ass. <laughs> Off an old white man. <laughs> Off an old white man. Yes, I actually do think I've heard this story before. Yes. Uh, well, did you use any weapons or it was just hands? Uh, there were hands thrown. Just hands? Just, just hands. thrown hands. Uh, I was in a couple of fights when I was in middle school, and then I got to high school and I stopped fighting. I exclusively focused on other crimes. <clears throat> um, but no, I got into a couple of fights, mostly on the school bus. Because that was just a time when I was just I was just a little mean kid. I mean, I you're just, also the least supervised on a school bus. It's true. I had a kid punch me in the mouth one time, and Ow. then I was like, I guess that was a fight that I immediately lost. Like I was like, why don't you say pump? Just punch well, me right in the mouth. <laughs> I was like, like, okay, okay, that's fair. Done. I guess I lose. Uh, but he did that weird thing after he was like, we're we're cool, like right? You're not like gonna go tell on me. And I was like, no, it's fine. No, that was fair. That was fair. I was being a little, I was, I was being a little being, shit, being a little asshole. Um. So, uh, duels, traditionally, a lot of people, when they think of duels, imagine, like, two men in French wigs with swords or pistols yes. standing outside of a fancy ballroom. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to get into those kind of duels, but the first one I talk about is a little weirder. I want to focus on some of the more strange ones. If you've never heard of duels before, a brief synopsis. Uh, duels were this thing they used to do in, not ancient times, but back in a little bit more cordial times, they would... Uh, have arguments, they would get into fights, and the way they decided to resolve it was the best way to save your honor was to go out and murder someone. Well, they didn't always kill each other. They didn't always. In fact, most, most duels did not end in actual death, but yeah. a lot of them did. Uh, they were almost always murder, though. Duels almost universally are illegal. Well, yes. They were very rarely approved of by the current ruling body, but... They were legally murder. They were... Well, no, I mean, that most of the time, it was still murder, like... Most of the people I'm going to talk about today, these duels happen and they are not sanctioned by the government. So, like the first guy we're talking about, this duel happened, uh, it's between two Frenchmen, a man named L'Enfant and a man named Melfant. Uh, They were playing pool, they were playing billiards in a hall together, and over the course of the evening they got drunk and they started arguing with each other. And we don't know exactly what they were arguing about, but it was decided that they had to duel about it. And not only did they have to duel about it, they had to duel right away about it. And so there was no time to fetch any pistols or swords or any of the things you would normally duel with. It was decided they were going to duel with pool balls. 
They were going to throw pool balls at each other. I beg your pardon? Yes, they were going to throw pool balls at each other. In fact, one pool ball, because they thought it would be silly to have two gentlemen just hucking pool balls at each other from 12 paces away. So they're just going to play a weird game of catch. Yes, they played an extremely deadly game of catch. So they decided they would draw lots to see who would throw first, and they would just throw a singular red pool ball back and forth at each other until it killed one of them. And so they drew lots. Melfont won. And then he stood 12 paces away. They stood out there in the garden. And apparently he faked him out for quite a while. <laughs> uh, and was just like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to destroy you. And kept, like, fake throwing at him. Like, he kept juking what at him. What an ass. <laughs> yes, he was an ass about it. Uh, so Melfont drew first. And then he just threw as hard as he could at Lenfont hit him in the forehead, and killed him. Oh, absolutely. First shot. As someone who's been hit with a pool ball, uh, I can say... (laughs) Bad. Oh, God, it's really bad. Uh, Thankfully, mine only hit me in the kidney. In the kidney. (laughs) Ow. What's like lower stomach? You have two kidneys, though. Yeah, you only need one. Yeah. Your blood's only like half as clean, though. Eh. I mean, they're both still operating. I didn't get it removed. (laughs) You didn't get it removed? No. Well, uh, this pool ball smacked Linfont in the head in the temple. So hard, he dropped dead immediately. And and then Malfont was immediately arrested. Oh, absolutely. They took him straight to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. And that was all I could find about him. It was like he threw a (laughs) threw a pool ball at some guy's head, murdered him, and then he's in jail. That's it. Worth it. So these are like, these are, so a lot of these duels, especially these ones happen between military men Mm -hmm. um, or like lords of parliament or lords of... Uh, the higher status. Yes, higher status people. Because, uh, it, just fun fact, if you're poor, you're not engaging in a duel. You're just, just murdering shit each out of each yeah, other. Yeah, it's just always murder. Um, but if you're high enough status, it can be considered a duel because then you can kind of get around it. Um, but That's this... where the phrase throwing the gauntlet down comes from. <gasps> what? The phrase throw down the gauntlet like you're going to fight someone. Um, mm-hmm. Initially in like feudal times, they would physically take off a gauntlet and throw it in front of their rival to say i'm fighting you now and that's initially how people started dueling was they would be throwing down gauntlets Uh, in fact if you watch certain like victorian or regency era tv people take off their little flimsy little gloves and smack each other in the face with them (laughs) and that's showing that they want to duel them and that comes from the throwing down of the gauntlet of Mm. physically throwing down a glove that makes sense it happened in the uh didn't that happen in Men in Tights? Yes. That's what I was Men trying to think of the name yes. for. He kept smacking him over the face, and then he pulls out a metal <laughs> yeah. glove. Yeah, the, the sheriff pulls out his little dainty like glove and like whaps Carrie Elwes kind of gently across the face, and Carrie Elwes turns and picks up a full like a gauntlet. full male gauntlet and whaps him. Um, so we're going to move to a, a slightly more high-status duel. Um, this one, while being high-status, is extremely silly. Uh, this is between the Earl of Barrymore and a man named Henry Howarth, who are both um, MPs in the British government at this time. Um, MP meaning? Oh, um, member of parliament. Thank you. I <laughs> remembered. Although, I will be honest with you, I was really relying on the acronym to get me through without having to say it because I did not know it. But I did remember it now that you put the fear in me. Uh, so the Earl of Barrymore and Henry Howarth, uh, they got into a fight. This is also a drunken. This is also a drunken duel. These men apparently also decided to duel four hours after the duel was actually declared and challenged. So they they so duels often had these people called seconds in them. In fact, it was part of the uh, rules of dueling is you had to have a second. And so what you would do is you and the person would agree to have a duel. So if me and Kay decide to have a duel, I would challenge her. And then you would send your best friend to talk to my best friend. And then our two best friends would try and negotiate a way for us to not duel each other. Try and figure out a way for us to like resolve the issue without mm-hmm. going to blows. But while the seconds of Lord Barrymar and Henry Howarth tried to get into the – tried to like clear the things up, um, Humphrey Howarth, the man who – excuse me, Henry Howarth, the man who was accused of cheating. Um, Why were they dueling? Uh, because uh, the Earl of Barrymore accused Henry Howarth of cheating at cards. So they were in Brighton, England, and they got into a drunken fight about cards. Oh, no, not cards. Yep. Uh, well, so any Earl of Barrymore accused Howarth of cheating. Howarth jumped over the table and punched Barrymore in the eye. Worth it. Uh, fair. I mean, but he then 
he punched him in the eye, and the early Barrymore was like, okay, well, I'm not going to fight you because you've punched me in the face, and I, I don't think I'd win that, um, but challenged him to a duel. And so they agreed to reach – they agreed to meet on the racetrack the next day with pistols. So like they – horse racing or dog racing? Probably both. I don't – was the same track? It was the, it was the racetrack in Brighton. I don't know if it was a dog track. Cool. Uh, that's my fault. So they show up to the duel that morning. They have their swords. Excuse me. They have their pistols and their seconds ready. And a bunch of people had shown up to watch this duel because duels were this big social event as well because people would come and watch, and that was what you did. It was a great way to spend a morning if you didn't have any job, um, and which was a lot of people at this time didn't have jobs. There were a bunch of like they just, just had money. Yeah, there were just a bunch of rich nobles just kind of hanging around, mm. and so. They show up that morning to do the duel, and Earl of Barrymore, obviously, you know, he's standing there. He's got his pistol. He's checking it. They, the seconds confirm that the pistols are exactly the same weight, and they're exactly the same size. They're the same gun. And then Howarth goes over and starts unbuttoning his jerkin, and then he starts unbuttoning his breeches, And then he takes off his shoes. <laughs> And then he takes all of his clothes off. Okay. He just takes all of his clothes off. It's like when someone starts a fight at a bar and takes off their shirt. Yeah, but like imagine but all going. of their clothes. But there's a, there's an audience of seventeen to twenty five like lords and ladies present. There is a man standing over there with a pistol who's ready to shoot you, and you're just like dick time out. To, <laughs> time to get my dick out. And he does. And Howard, to be clear, is of more my body type than anything. So he's like a elderly obese man, uh, and so he strips down and then he walks over grabbed his pistol cocks it and is like all right i'm good i'm ready to go he probably didn't want to get blood on his clothes he did not want to get blood on his clothes that is like not exactly the reason because his second ran over and was like hey um what mr How- doing, mr howarth um <laughs> sir sir are you aware that you're not wearing any pajamas uh and so Howarth just leans over and goes, yeah, I was a surgeon in India. I worked for the British East India Company, and I – like he was a surgeon. He treated a lot of men who had been shot and had mm-hmm. gunshot wounds. And apparently the reason that most of those men died was not because of the actual bullet wound. Infection. was because of Infection. And so what would happen is you would get shot, and then your clothes would be pushed into your wound by the bullet. And they could usually pull the bullet out, but there was no way they could get all the little pieces of fiber. Especially since everything was probably wool. Yeah. And everything is dirty because you wear the same outfit seven or eight days in a row, and you wash it once a week. Yeah, and if you're a military man, you get one military and yeah, coat absolutely. And... So he <laughs> strips all of his clothes off. His seconds like, "What are you doing?" And Howarth kind of light, lightly explains it to him. Doesn't explain to anyone else. He's just like, "Yeah, I don't want to get infected." And he walks over and goes, "All right, I'm ready to duel." And apparently, the Earl of Barrymore, apparently the Earl of Barrymore just stopped. Was like, I. I'm good. It's like when someone takes their shirt off in a fight and you're like, no, you're going too far with this. Uh, And so uh, there's a couple different reports. Some people say the early Barrymore just like walked off, (laughs) just like dropped the pistol and was like, I'm good and left. Uh, Other people say he did what was very traditional at that time, which is that he just pointed his gun into the air and then fired it and then just left. Because that was basically – so a lot of these duels would happen. This is a kind of a cool thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of duels were not meant to end in death. So most sword fights, if you were going to be doing with swords, it would be to first blood. Mm -hmm. So you would stab someone in the arm. Okay, I bloodied you. Is the duel resolved? And so the seconds would come out, and they would try and talk it over, and they would go back to the different combatants, and they'd be like, hey, man, you got stabbed. You know, you defended your honor. You were willing to die. They tried, you know, try and gas him up, trying to get him to, you know, agree to a resolution. Mm-hmm. But if that couldn't happen, then you would go back, you go to second blood, and then the seconds would come out again and again and again. But with pistols, it was a lot easier to die, right? Because well, yeah. pistols are inaccurate, but if you get shot, you're probably going to die. Well, it depends where. It does depend where. Um, and so what normally would happen is these pistol shots is they would purposely aim away from each other. They mm-hmm. would aim, like, at them and then probably four or five feet to the left. And they would shoot, and then once both men had shot at each other, both men had air quotes, big air quotes, shot at each other. <laughs> that was it. A duel had happened, They're and like, neither cool. one of them, neither one of them, had killed. They had. We're willing to it. die for this. Yeah, you're willing to die for this. Yeah, cool. I'm willing to die for this. For sure, we say as we point our guns away from each other and shoot to prove we're big manly men. Um, but that was a lot. What you would do is if. Like so, this next duel I'm going to talk about a guy between. This is their two Australian duels. Actually, this is about the luckiest unlucky man in the world. Oh no! 
um, guy named Snodgrass. I, what? His name is Snodgrass. He's from Melbourne. Snod. Snod. Grass. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. All right. Yep. Uh, so Snodgrass, Snodgrass is one of these guys that uh, is a very hot-headed young man. He's part of the Melbourne Club. Um, he's Australian. And so he and a guy named Ryrie get into an argument. Um, again, we don't know what it's about, but we do know that these men are so drunk and it's so late in the evening, they agree to duel each other. They're like, we will duel immediately. We will go to Batman's Hill and we will shoot each other. Batman's Hill? Yes. I I want you to know, I tried very hard to find out why it was called Batman's Hill. I assume, I assume there was some sort of lo- local legend about a Christopher Nolan movie. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why it's called Batman's Hill. Okay. But yes, it was a hill. It's called sure, Batman's Hill. Yeah. Uh, wow. So they they agree to duel each other, and they search the entire club and find that there are no dueling pistols available. Like there's regular guns, but there's no actual dueling pistols. Oh no! Which have shame. to be the exact same size. Oh. So they go and they 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 ride at midnight to go find a person who they know has dueling pistols. They wake him up. They get those pistols, um, and as they are leaving, they check the pistols and realize there's no ammo. <clears throat> So they search the entirety of the town. They find no ammo. They realize the only person who has ammo is the commanding officer of the local garrison. And so they go wake him up at three in the morning, him and his wife. And they're like, can we have bullets, please? We need to shoot each other. <laughs> can you imagine just knock, 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 knock. Um, Sheriff? <laughs> um, can I borrow two bullets? <laughs> well, this is Australian, so I don't want to. No, I don't want to do an Australian accent. But basically going and begging the Australian marshal to give them bullets. Um, and so they, he gets he gives them two bullets. He does it? He gives them two he bullets. He gives them the bullets? Well, they lie to him about it. They don't tell him why they need the bullets. You don't think he went, you only need two bullets. And they go, yes. We're hunting. Drunk a, men. We're hunting exactly two different pigs. We only need two bullets. We're that good. We're excellent shots. What the hell? Yep. He gives them the two bullets. Um, and then gives them a stern reminder that <clears throat> dueling is illegal. Mm. He's not very good at his job, I don't think. No, he's not. Then they go wake up a surgeon, because that's another rule of dueling, is that a surgeon must always be present at the site of an honorable and gentlemanly duel. So if someone is wounded, they have the best chance of surviving. So they go wake up a surgeon, and then finally they get to Batman's Hill, and it is morning. At this point, the whole town's awake. Yes, the whole town is awake. Well, also, all night, two drunk jackalopes have been running around town begging people for pistols and bullets. Hi, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> hey, do you have any... Do you mind... Ugh. Do you have any bullets? Officer, please. <laughs> do you have any whiskey? <laughs> we haven't been drinking. So... Snodgrass and Ryrie uh, get up to the top of Batman's Hill, um, and Snodgrass is so exhausted, he pulls the pistol out, he loads it, he points it down at the ground, the respectful thing to do, and immediately shoots himself in the foot. Ha! <laughs> he shoots himself right in the foot, shoots yes, his toe. Yes. Um, and so he shoots himself in the foot and just, like, runs around screaming. Just, ow, ow, you know, because it, it hurts, but it's not life-threatening. And so finally his second like grabs him and calms him down and goes, Ryrie has to shoot at you now. And Snodgrass is like, oh no, because you only get one bullet. Them's the rules. Them's the rules, baby. And so Ryrie, watching this man having shot himself in the foot, points his gun in the air and fires off. He's like, you know what? Spares his life. <laughs> you know what? This is, this is fine. This has gone on far enough. I forgive you. <laughs> you shot your own foot. We're good, fam. Mm-hmm. So three years later, Snodgrass challenges another person to a duel. Mr. Grass. Uh, challenges Sir Redmond Barry to a duel. Mr. Grass. <laughs> yep. Oh. Uh, apparently, Barry had sent, sent a letter to a friend of his that said some mean things about Snodgrass, presumably that he had only nine toes and even less moral integrity. <laughs> uh, but Snodgrass challenges to a duel. They gather at a place called Albert Park. It, they find guns this time. Oh, good. Lord Barry is... Did they find bullets? They did find bullets. Thank goodness. Uh, Lord Barry is apparently very... Excuse me, Sir Barry is apparently very, very, like, well-dressed for the occasion. That's what a lot of this research was. They were just like, and Barry looked, like, really hot that day. Like, he wore... He was so hot. He looked really good. His best velvet doublet. Like, yeah. Mm. He had all those, like, nice, nice clothes on. Look at that button. And they got they did it on the beach. Like, so there's, like, a beach mm. at Albert Park. So it was, like, a beach site. It was, like, a sunrise. It's like, like a dual. Fabio cover. <laughs> book cover. Yeah. And I just, I don't know, I don't know anything about the physical description of Snodgrass. I do have a picture of Barry, but 
It's probably uh, just like a random dude. I'm just imagining just some guy with like long, lanky hair. Like he just looks kind of <laughs> gross and he's just like, screw you. I challenge you to a duel. How dare you? We fighting. So <laughs> Barry gets his pistol and walks 12 paces away, calmly aims at Snodgrass and just waits for the command to shoot. Snodgrass takes his pistol and while playing with it, getting it ready, shoots himself again. <laughs> Please tell me he shot himself in the other foot. He didn't shoot himself in the other foot. He apparently shot very close but missed himself. Uh, nearly hit his own hat off. So he shot up. Oh, for the love of God. By accident. And so Snodgrass, again, nearly shoots his own stinking head off. And then Barry just goes... <sighs> you know what? Points the gun into the air and fires. <laughs> and doesn't kill Snodgrass. This man has been spared twice. I feel like this has happened more times to Mr. Grass. But, this is just but the they just time. don't report it because they're like... <laughs> Fucking snods at it again. Well, he almost shot himself again. <laughs> he almost shot himself again. Well, this is actually Snodgrass. So Snodgrass luckily didn't kill Richard Barry. Uh, excuse me, Robert Barry. Redmond Barry. There we go. Uh, Rod Redmond went on to become a Supreme Court judge of Australia. And probably saw Mr. Grass in his courtroom <laughs> more than once. Probably saw Mr. Grass again. Um, but I've done, I think that's three of mine, so why don't we go ahead and do one of yours? Okay, we seem to be in international waters. Yes, Australia specifically. So we'll start with international waters. International. Um, international. International. Fun. Let's go slightly north of Australia to the Kingdom of Japan. Okay. Uh, kingdom? Eh. Empire? At the time, At no. the time, not an empire? No, not an empire. This is the 1500s. Back in time to the 1500s, I think we are going to talk about Mr... Miyamoto Musashi, which is now a surprisingly well-known name um, amongst the common folk. I don't know what to call y'all. Am I the common folk? Yes. I did know about Musashi, but yes. I, it's only because I watch Puppet History. I only know about him because there's a magic card based off of him. <gasps> oh, that's true. <clears throat> that's true. I want. But uh, he was the samurai. He was on the losing side of a battle once when he was a kid, and then he became a ronin. After and then he apparently swore to never lose again, and he didn't. <laughs> I'll never lose again. Oh, okay. Okay. Shit. I guess I'm just better. All right. Like this guy, duel after duel after duel. We were talking about duels. How Snodgrass probably had a bunch of duels. Mister Musashi had, I want to say, it was sixty or eighty. Eighty different fights. To was the it eighty? And he won them all. <laughs> Although my favorite story with him is uh, there was a dojo he was fighting against mm -hmm. and one person challenged him and he went and he killed him. And the rest of the dojo was like, hmm, we need to defend our honor. Here's that guy's son. <laughs> and they tried to do that and he killed that guy. And then he went, hmm, we got one more. Here's this 12 year old boy <laughs> who is that guy's son. And they're like, and then, then we'll get him. This 12 year old He'll get him. -old and Musashi came in and was like, nah, this kid's dead. And killed the kid. And the dojo uh, dissolved because there was no leadership. He took out three generations. Three generations of three the family. Generations. Just completely decimated a family line uh, in like a matter of days. Brought a chainsaw to the family tree. Oh, absolutely. Just prune that shit. <laughs> but uh, his most famous fight is between him and Sasaki Kojiro? Sosaki Kojiro. Um, he was Mr. Mr. Kojiro was another samurai, but he had friends. And he knew people, and he wasn't a ronin. He was part of a dojo. And so it got to the point where he was like, I need to prove myself. I will fight Miyamati, Miyamoto, Miyamoto Musashi. And everyone was like, ooh, he's going to fight him. So they issued a duel to Musashi. Uh, however, Musashi at this point had a reputation of A winning and b being a jackass about it <laughs> and what i mean when i say that is he was constantly like psychologically torturing his opponents before battle so with the dojo fight with the three the three generations murdered by the end the dojo was like okay we're going to ambush him <laughs> that's not really a duel but Go off. When he comes in, we are going to ambush him and we are going to kill him because he's killed two people by now. And they were like, well, for the past two fights, he's shown up three hours late <laughs> at the appointed place. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go 
three hours early, and we're going to set up this ambush. Guess who also showed up three hours early? <laughs> Miyamoto Musashi. Miyamoto Musashi hid in a bush. <laughs> And watched them all set up this ambush and went, hmm, that's weird. Popped out of the bush, killed the kid, and ran. I am the most powerful samurai on these islands. Everyone will die. I must hide in this bush for three hours <laughs> so I could kill a 12-year-old. So when Sasaki Kujiro decided that he was going to duel him, I'm sure he was expecting some bullshit. And mm-hmm. oh boy, did bullshit occur. <laughs> they decided it's going to be on a beach, you know, another Fabio cover duel. Mm-hmm. Two Japanese samurai. These men really do love. They love the their drama. Their their drama. It's very drama. They love the drama, but he appears. He's got his entourage. Musashi is nowhere to be found. It is the appointed time. So they wait, and they wait, and three hours later, they're still waiting. And then a man who was on a boat, just out in the bay, starts mm-hmm. rowing in, and they're like, "Okay, fisherman's done." No. It was Mushashi on that boat with that fisherman. And what had he been doing? Not fishing. He had decided to carve a training sword out of the oar. So he just took a stick. Wait, he brought... Is the other guy wielding a stick sword? It's an oar. It is a wooden oar. Mm -hmm. So the fisherman was like... Musashi goes up to this fisherman and is like, Hi, I'm Miyamoto Musashi. And he's like, I know. He's amazing. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. He's like, would you mind taking me out? I know you're going fishing. Would you mind taking me out for a little bit? And he goes, uh, sure. And he takes one of this poor man's oars and carves it into, I forget the name, but it is a tra- essentially a training sword. Um, it looks like a sword, but it's just for training. It's wood. Mm-hmm. And then Miyamoto, Miyamoto just sits there for a little bit and he goes, okay, let's go back in. And then Kojiro's on the bank waiting Mm -hmm. and when he finally shows up they're like what the hell was where were you Miyamoto's like no talk only fight only fight (laughs) so they start to fight and sure as shit Miyamoto wrecks Kojiro with a wooden sword just over the head knocks him unconscious much like a billiard ball flung by two drunken (laughs) gentlemen in the middle of the night uh, he kills him with this wooden sword while Kojiro had a fully metal blade. Why? Why does he feel the need to flex so hard? Is it like a status thing? It's like, I'll well, beat you with a tennis racket, and I'll, I'll give you an AK-47. I'm going to take a tennis racket. Let's see who wins. Well, he was a ronin, so he had no master. He was a samurai without a master. Uh-huh. And he had a reputation. He had the honor of winning, at this point, 79 duels. Jesus he had... He was like the unkillable man. He made his own fighting style, which was one long blade and one short blade, and you would fight with both of them. And he created that by himself. And so he was known. And at this point, he's like 50-something years old. (laughs) He's an old man by 1500s era age. I love that the idea of this grandpa just getting off this boat is, one second, Sonny, I gotta finish carving this stick into a sword so I can whoop your ass! And then when he's done, he looks at everyone around, because everyone is stunned that an old man with a wooden sword just kicked their boss's ass, (laughs) and he bucks it back into the boat and rows away. All right, time to go! Yeah, and they start like chasing him down the beach, because they're like, hey, wait, come back here! (laughs) Come back. And so he runs his little ass onto the boat and the fisherman's like, oh shit, I only got one oar to row this boat with. <laughs> I'm just desperately rowing in circles. Desperately rowing away. Uh, and that was his last duel ever. His last duel ever? He clowned on this man with a wooden sword? Yes. He went, you know what? I'm done with violence. And he proceeded to write books on how to fight and books on how to live a proper Buddhist lifestyle. One is called, I want to say, The Book of the Five Rings. Uh, he wrote a book about his fighting style. He wrote, he painted, and he lived to a pretty good age for the 1500s. Granted, uh, Japanese age ranges usually are longer than the normal folk of white world. Uh, yeah, European life expectancy was pretty piss poor. Yeah, and Japan had a surprising amount of uh, not Europeans. So. Didn't they, didn't they, I, I've been watching this Netflix show, Blue Eye Samurai, so I want you to know. Which I believe is based off of Miyamoto Musashi. Really? Yes. That's very fucking cool. The lead character, the Blue-Eyed Samurai, mm-hmm. uh, is undefeated. How much of the show have you watched? Five 
five episode. I have no spoilers for you. I have nothing for you, spoiler wise. Uh, no, that's a it's a good show. I I know for a second there was a period where Japan exiled or refused to open its borders to any outside. Yes, any outside influences. Yes, which is the time period in which Blue Eyed Samurai is set. Mm-hmm. But that's a cool story. I've heard a lot about him. I just love the idea that he's like, well, my last fight. I think I'll show. Maybe he wanted to die. Maybe that was it. Maybe he was like, maybe if I bring a wooden sword, maybe I'll lose and then I can die. I doubt it. Probably not. Nah. He just seems. Oh, like, boy, was just too good. I think he was just better he's than just everyone too good. else. He's better than everyone else. He was. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a reference to anyone else, but I can't think of anyone nah. who's that goat. good. Greatest of all time. He's the Miyamoto Meryl... Musashi, goat. He's the Meryl Streep of <laughs> samurai d- duels. Think Meryl Streep is the goat? Yeah. People call her the goat. Intriguing. She was in Devil Wears Prada. It's really good. That doesn't mean anything to me. You've never watched Devil Wears Prada? No, I just hate that movie. Oh, okay. It makes me angry. She was in Into the Woods? She was. She was the witch. (laughs) Not a witch of your wife. That's not that reference. That's a different movie. Okay. So, uh, well, I'm going to take us to a more European base. We're going to move away from Japan. Um, And we are going to go to... A duel between two ladies. <gasps> That's right. Women can kill each other for dumb bullshit reasons, yes, too. Yes, we can. Um, <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> Is the other fight you were in, did you murder another woman? <laughs> No, I was in middle school. <laughs> oh, you're in middle school. That's true. That's true. Uh, so this is a fight between, and these are, uh, there's a lot of French, I'm going to say now, and I'm going to say most of it wrong. Bonsoir. No. Okay. No, no, no. Let, mm, okay. So this is a duel between Madame de Polignac versus the Marquis de Nestle. And when I say Nestle, I'm going to pronounce it like the chocolate drink makers. It's about to be like, like the, the mm-hmm. people that own everything. I don't believe they are related, but it's quite possible that they are. Uh, but I don't know. So they are dueling over a man. <gasps> yes, and not just any man. That He's not worth it, girls. <laughs> he is He's not, not worth it. He is not worth it. Although I would like to say every single character in this story is married. Yeah. All of them. The intrigue. Mm-hmm. The plot is very thick. The, the plot is a nice, thick cornstarch slurry. Mm. It's very thick. A roux. So it's a roux, yes. In fact, they are dueling over the right to be the paramour of the Duke de Richelieu. Now, if you know the name ne- Richelieu, Richelieu yeah. yes, you probably know Cardinal Richelieu, yes. who is very famous for helping consolidate power in France. This is not that guy. This is one of his descendants, uh, a big, stupid grandson of his, who is apparently very hot. That is what we know about the Duke de Richelieu. There's actually a lot of books about him. What I know about Duke de Richelieu is he is very hot. Um, and anything he is, else? Uh, he is bad at scheduling things. That is why I know this. Same. Uh, so he apparently was dating both of these women, the Marquis de Nestle and Madame de Polignac. The Marquis is a little bit older than the Madame de Polignac. Um, so he had his secretary arrange a rendezvous with both of these women on the same day. He was going to meet with one of them at two o'clock and one of them at four o'clock, his which poor is secretary. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. His poor secretary, just like, um, so when would you like your <clears throat> uh, appointment set for? He's like, I'd like one of the women at two o'clock. We're going to spend, I think, like 45 minutes to an hour and a half, and I'm going to get her right out of here. Next one at four o'clock, um, which is just, I don't, I don't understand. If you're going to date two women, you can't be scheduling them within two hours of one another. That's too Unless much. Unless they know each other and they know about it. They, these women did not. Yeah. I these women were not much. cool with it. So they, uh, they both, they were accidentally scheduled to see him at the same time by his secretary. His secretary sent appointments to both of them. They were both sent to come at two o'clock. And so when they arrived, uh, Madame de, uh, excuse me, Madame, the Marquis, Marquis de Nestle jumped on Madame de Polignac and they started ripping each other's outfits apart. Get wrecked. So if you imagine these like very, very French women, these like big poofy hairstyles and all the jewels and all the braids and all like the many, many necklaces, they just started like ripping each other's apart, like outfits apart and throwing pieces at each other. So apparently they were literally like plucking diamonds out of each other's hair and then throwing them at each other. Ooh, diamonds can be sharp. Diamonds can be sharp. Well, these are big stones too. Like, because these are very, very witch women. So they're they're pulled apart by their attendees, their attendants, and they decided they were going to have a full duel about it in the forest of Bois. Oh, here we go. Bois de Boulogne. They go into the woods. They go to the French Into woods. the woods. Into the, into the woods. And With out Meryl of the Meryl Street. Meryl Street. There we go. We made full circle. 
So they decided they chosen weapons were going to be pistols, and they advanced on each other. They walked forward. So the tool, the terms of this duel is that they would walk towards each other. They would just continue to advance on each other, and they would stop at, I believe, five paces apart. But you could fire at any point during the the advance. delicate lady eyes can't see. <laughs> the delicate lady eyes, yes. Um, so they were going to walk towards each other with their pistols ready, and they could fire whenever they wanted. Which, But because they only get one bullet, that basically means whoever fires first... If you miss, you're definitely going to get shot you because screwed. the other one can just walk straight up to you and you can't do anything about it. And so dodge. They're basically playing chicken. So one of them walks straight up and the marquee walks up and De Polignac starts going, um, "Fire first. Mind you don't miss me." It starts like teasing her. It's like, "Shoot first. Shoot first and then I'm going to fucking kill you." Um and the marquee fired first and completely missed. Oh. And then Polignac called out, your hand, it trembles with passion, and then shot her in the shoulder. <laughs> Just popped her. And so the Marquis falls to the ground. She's bleeding. She's crying. Polignac immediately jumps into a carriage and leaves. Because again, duels are... She was going to get arrested. Well, duels are straight up illegal. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Marquis falls down, and her second runs over, and she is covered in blood. And so they start, like, sopping up the wounds. They're trying to heal it, and they realize she's just been grazed in the shoulder. Like she has the she has basically a big scrape where this thing has just barely brushed her mm. and she's fine. She just has a scratch. And so she like her She's att- like, I ain't done yet. Her attendant calms her down and she realizes that she's not dying and she goes, Oh, thank God. I thank the heavens because I've won. And all of these people who have watched these what? two women fight are like, What? What do you mean you, you won? Didn't, sweetie You didn't win. Sweetie, honey you bear. got shot. <laughs> Um, baby, sweetie baby girl, honey baby. <laughs> um, and she goes, she goes, well, I, I got shot. I spilled my noble blood for the Duke de Richelieu. He's bound to recognize my love as superior. Um, no, no, he didn't. Uh, because he, she goes back to the palace and finds that who is currently cuddled up with the Duke de Richelieu, Madame de Polignac. Uh, so he basically, they duel each other for his love, and then she loses and is like, oh my god, she he'll love me so much now that I've bled my noble blood for him. No. And he goes, no, I don't care. I don't care no, about you. Works, honey bear. Um, <laughs> well, I, will, I would say every single one of these people is married. He got married, Duke de Richelieu did, he got married to a woman named Rosalie de Rochart in 1782 at the age of 15. Um, and she was a hunchback. It was a political marriage, so they apparently never even consummated the marriage. It was very well known that she so didn't... So they weren't married. She didn't like him. He didn't like her. And it was just fine. In that time, they weren't married. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, they would never openly say that the marriage hadn't been consummated. But it was, it was reported like, that nah, they... like, were... nah, I fuck. <laughs> oh, no. He, he boned. He, he boned fucks. many, many people. There's books on how many people he boned. Um, he was the grandson of Louis the Fourteenth. so... Oh, he fucked. Yes. Yes, he did. He, he did was the fuck. Sun King. Um, he was the Sun King's grandson. He was the grandson king. He was the Comet King. He was the Comet King. Uh, now, this next one, uh, this one we're actually going to go way, way back. We're going to get a little bit more medieval. Um, <laughs> this is the one I told you about a little bit earlier oh, we're yes. going to be talking about. Yes, I don't want to spoil it. but uh, So this is a duel between two Nords, a man named Guy of Steenvord. Versus a man named Iron Herman. Nice. I know, right? I love Iron it's, Herman. It's a good name. Uh, so, Guy of Steve Dor was, excuse me, of Steen Dor, he was accused of conspiracy to kill a man named Charles the Good, who was killed. Was he good? He was, well, uh, that's the thing. Uh, kings and, like, rulers that get assassinated tend to be posthumously named the Good, unless they were really, really bad, because we're like, oh no, he got murdered. That's why everybody really likes John Ke- uh, F. Kennedy. Because he got assassinated. He wasn't a bad president, but we know a lot about him. Like, he cheated on his wife with Marilyn Monroe. He did a bunch of drugs. He was, like, on meth all the time. But then he got assassinated. And so we were like, oh, Kennedy, great president. He he was good. He was fine. But he did get assassinated, which is why he got glorified. Same with Abraham Lincoln. Well, we're not going to get into Kennedy's assassination. Oh, I'm sure that's another podcast. My dad and I, uh, brief tangent, my dad and I went to the... um, Went to Dallas. The Grassy Knoll. We went to the Grassy Knoll, and this guy walked up, and he was just like, yeah, that's where it happened, right there. And my dad was like, Asher, let's go. And I was like, okay. And kind of walked away from that guy. Walk in the middle of the road. My dad, I just walked away, 
And my dad was like, yeah, don't talk to that guy. I was like, why? He's like, because that man wants to tell you about ice bullets. <laughs> <laughs> that man's going to try and tell you about how it really happened. We, we're good. We're good. Just keep walking, Asher. And we went to a Hooters and we had chicken wings. I have a friend who works in the National Archives and has seen the suit that JFK died in. Ugh. And uh, Jackie O's dress. And the gun that shot him. Uh, well, the first gun or the second gun? There was only one gun. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, yes. Okay. All right. And we landed on the moon, too. All right. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm joking. I'm full joking. We've been to the moon. We've been to the moon. I apologize. The look I, the look I just got. <laughs> I have a, two degrees in history. I have two degrees in history. Yes, we went. To, we absolutely went to the moon. So anyway. So Guy of Steenvoord is accused of conspiracy to kill Charles the Good. Now, the reason he was accused of this is because he was uh, married to the niece of one of the conspirators. So one of these guys we definitely know did it. He is married to the niece of that guy. Okay. And so they're like, oh, clearly this guy's also involved. He's you know, involved by blood. Now, he denies all involvement, but he is challenged to trial by combat by Iron Herman. So Iron Herman basically says, I see that you you promised you didn't have anything to do with the murder of Charles the Good. But True. what if what if I fought you about it, and if you lose, you did have something to do with the the murder of Charles the Good, and we're going to hang you about it? Wouldn't he be dead? Mm-hmm. You'd think that. But we'll see how this goes. So he agrees. I mean, he can't not really agree. Yeah. And so they go to a local farm and they mount horses and they charge each other with lances. And so Guy immediately puts a lance right into Iron Herman's chest plate, unhorses him, huh. knocks him under the ground. Herman stands up, slays the horse from underneath Guy, Ooh. basically stabs his horse and disembowels it. Um, sorry, content warning. Horses will be harmed in the making of this podcast. Um, so the horse goes down. Guy slips right off of it, and then they just start wailing on each other with swords. And these are both heavily armed combatants. So, you know, most duels we think of, like, people in no armor with little light sabers, kind of like ting, 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 you know, like a pirate duel. No, no, no. These people are in full heavy armor, smacking each other with heavy broadswords, heavy great swords. Um, and they wail on each other for about five minutes until they grow so exhausted they can't hold their swords up anymore. So they throw them to the side and they start punching each other. They just start wrestling. Wrestling. Yeah. Well, so in when you're when you're a mounted knight, wrestling is actually very, very hard to do because you're so heavy. Mm -hmm. If you fall down, it's almost impossible to get back up again. That's one of the things a lot of people that was why they were constantly working on how to make armor lighter and more efficient. Because a a whole person, a squire, had to help you put armor on. So if you're wearing a full suit of armor and you fall down, you're down for a good bit until you pull some pieces off or until you regain the strength to physically stand back up again. It is hard to do. And so Guy gets thrown to the ground. Iron Herman just starts wailing on him, just fists to the face, elbows, and he's just pounding on him. But this armor is tough, and now he's on the ground. Truly, the armor is not is it's absorbing all of the blows because it's just going straight through the armor to the ground. And so Herman is just whacking the crap out of, excuse me, a guy is just whacking the crap out of Iron Herman, just beating the absolute crud out of him. But Herman just lays there, getting stronger and, like, resting he's and like, taking you know, a breather. He's like, you know, this is fine. He just takes a breather, and while he's taking a breather, his hand is slowly working its way down towards the only part of the body that isn't protected by the armor, which is where the cuirass reaches and buckles onto the breeches. What is a cuirass? Um, okay, maybe I said a word that I don't know. But, but what I what I mean is the chainmail shirt, like the plate shirt, where it attaches to basically he's reaching for his groin, his midsection. Oh, he's gonna grab his dick. He is gonna grab his. He doesn't grab his dick. He grabs his testicles. <gasps> so, uh, and the the description of this is actually very very flowery, but it essentially boils down to Iron Herman reaches his hand in and grabs Guy of Steve Dor's testicles. So hard that he picks him up. Like he picks him up by his testicles, then grabs him and like holds him up and basically suplexes him onto the ground by his own by testicles. By his balls? By his testicles. Oh no. He does a full testicles and he throws him onto the ground by his testicles. And apparently Guy does not get back up, just lies there no, and cries. No. I no. Fully you would just to be clear, You're almost done. definitely dead. You're done. Almost definitely dead. Like, that would be enough to kill any man 
is if you were to because the what he did was the last thing he let go of was the testicles. He ripped off that guy's balls. And so 100%. Iron Herman stands back up and goes, I win. Guy of Steve Dorr is a traitor. They drag Guy of Steve Dorr to the gallows and they hang him. And he's like, please. An kill hour me. later. Yeah. Kill me. I'm I done. can't imagine a man more excited to die. Guy of Steve Dorr is like, I'm tapping out. I'm tapping out now. You hang me or not, I'm done. <laughs> Tapped out. Tapped out. All right. So I have I have one last duel to talk about, and I'm gonna save that one for the very end because okay. it is it is fun. The silliest. By far, so I want like to hear your next duel. I have a family that keeps dying in duels. You have a family, not personally. Uh, I take you know who Francis Scott Key is. Yes, he wrote the very famous song, "The Star Spangled Banner." Yes, during the Battle of Fort McHenry Mm -hmm. in 1812, he was on the ship in the harbor while they were bombing Baltimore, and he saw the flag still flying above Fort McHenry. He decided to write a poem, and that poem became. The Star Spangled Banner. Uh, He had many children. And his children kept dying in duels. In duels? I say that. He had seven children. I believe seven. Two of them died in duels. Uh, That's a pretty bad ratio. Well, the second one isn't really a duel. The first one's definitely a duel. Uh, His first son, Daniel. Well, not his first son. One of his older sons, Daniel. Mm -hmm. He was a midshipman in the Navy. He was in, in school, he was 19, he was in school, and he got into an argument with another fellow named John Sherburn about the speed of steamships. <laughs> and which steamship was faster between two. Now, I couldn't find what steamships they were talking about, but they were arguing about steamships to the extent where <laughs> Daniel decided to duel John. My boat's faster than your boat. No, it wasn't even their boats. They were on the same ship. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure, from what I've read, Daniel was on the ship because he was court-martialed. What? This kid was an asshole. Okay. He was a prick. Okay. And it's well known that he was a prick. Uh, so he's John Sherburn was like, yeah, sure, okay. They come to port in Mississippi, and Daniel's like, I'm going to shoot you. Automatically gets detained. <laughs> Steps off the boat. Now that I'm on sovereign soil, I'm going to shoot. Wham! (laughs) Automatically gets detained, and John goes back to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Uh, Francis Scott Key then has to pick his happy ass up from Baltimore and go get his stupid ass son out of jail. Hi, Daniel. So, one of the highest district attorneys in Washington, D.C., trumps his happy ass down, like, looks at the jail guard with one nod, and the jail guard goes, all right, you can have him back. And he takes Daniel back up, and everything's fine I for guess like a you week. Did write that really nice song we all like. I like, suppose oh, shit, you can have your son guy. out of jail. And then, in like the next week, Daniel sees John. Uh, Daniel Key sees John Sherburn just out and about, and he just calls him a coward. <laughs> Just yells, you're a coward, like across the street. You're a coward. And he's like, we're going to duel about it. And John's just like, where the fuck did you come from? I left your ass in jail. What the hell? And he walks away. And like, nothing comes of it until uh, Daniel is at home at his dad's house. And uh, what is his name? Thomas Mattingly, who was the second to Sherburn, midshipman Sherburn, uh, appears at his house and is like mm-hmm. in the front door and he's like look if you want to do this we're doing it today we're doing this now we will duel they will <laughs> duel if he wants you to and daniel pretty much like goes like well i mean if we have to but we have to do it now because my dad's not home <laughs> and my we gotta do it quick when my dad gets home because my dad can't know i'm gonna get grounded if he finds like, that i'm trying dad, to murder someone his dad's not home and his mom is shopping like <laughs> He's like, my family's not home. We gotta do this now. <laughs> you guys want to come over? My uh, my parents aren't at home. My parents aren't home. <laughs> we so could, I don't know. We could, like shoot at each other. They end up at a place called Bladenburg, which is a well known dueling ground outside of DC. It's not as like, cool as Batman's Hill. But I mean, sure. yeah, but it is like. So many people. It's called the Dark and Bloody Grounds. There is like a historical marker there that calls it that and is like, look, so many people decided to duel here. It was like a mile down the road from a bar. But Daniel was like, all right, fine. Let's go duel. Whatever. It's fine. And he picks up his second, who's his cousin, 
who's just as much of an asshole <laughs> as he is. I know it'll make the situation better. Another absolute... Another prick. <laughs> um, Another His cousin's guy. name was Richard West. So his cousin, Dick West, <laughs> and Daniel Key show up on June 22nd at the Bladenburg grounds. And John Sherburn was there with Thomas Mattingly. And they look at him and... And the seconds are like, let's let's talk this over. Except Dick West is an asshole. Mm-hmm. So they don't really talk anything over. And Sherburn looks like they're talking, they're talking. Sherburn's looking at Maddenly and they're talking. He's like, look, you need to talk and see if we can sort this out. And Key apparently overheard this and says, it's useless to waste time talking about it. I'm not agreeing to no... I ain't agreeing to no apology. I'm gonna shoot that man. And then... There's there's a couple books that talk about this. One is called A Snowstorm in August, which is about some race riots that happened around the same time. Okay. And then there is, uh, I forget what it, though it's called, but it is pretty much a Francis Scott Key memoir. And one of them says, we have come to fight, not talk, said West, who was almost ab- as obnoxious as his cousin, though not quite so audacious. <laughs> uh, he's, kind of a, he's kind of a bastard, but if you challenge him about it, he'll back up. The sooner it's over, the better. And uh, Sherburn's like, listen, I don't want to kill you, Key. Daniel, I don't want to kill you. And Key pretty much just goes, shut the fuck up. I'm going to kill you. (laughs) I don't want to kill you. That's too bad because I want to kill you. And he's like, fucking fine. So they do their 10 paces. They look at each other. West, Dick West is in there in the middle and goes like, fire. They both miss. But they both shot at each other. Excellent. And now Key's all flustered, and he goes like, God damn, I gotta load my gun again. (laughs) What, is the duel not over? They shot at each other. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Oh, no. This is two (laughs) 19-year-olds. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. They're going to the death. Also, Key's a dick. I'm sure. Daniel Key is like, no, no, no. We're still going. Mm -hmm. Like, the seconds are going to come at each other. But no, he goes, no, we're going to load up again before they have a chance. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Mattingly is the one that takes the center. Uh, They both fire again at each other. Yes. Neither at the sky. Key gets shot in the chest. Okay. Good. Uh, Sherburn, nothing happens to Sherburn, but it, like, knocks him forward, breaks all his ribs. The phrase is toppled onto his rear. Toppled onto his booty? He fell backwards. Oh, no. So he fell backwards. And the entire time, people are like, we have to... He's like, oh, my God. Like, Sherburn's like, holy shit. We got to get you up. We got to go to a doctor. All right, yeah. Let's get the surgeon out. So he runs... No, no. There was no surgeon. This is not a Twilight between two 17-year-olds in, like, 1836. I'll have you know I read at least six Wikipedia articles. This is not a licensed duel. Thank you very much. This is not a licensed duel. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's no surgeon present. So Sherburn's like, oh my god, he like goes to help him up, and Keys pretty much goes, don't touch me, and then <laughs> dies. <laughs> don't touch me, damn it. <sighs> he dies. He was 20. <laughs> but, so that's the expert, like, from, that's uh, a snowstorm in August. But, so Francis Scott Key was, like, a super, a very religious man. Does he, does he write another poem about it? No, but he lost his son. Oh no. And it was like a tragedy, like, they brought the son back to the to the house and like mm-hmm. there was screaming with his sisters and his mom apparently they didn't know he was a massive asshole well yeah and they also didn't learn their lesson as to pissing off people because mm-hmm. not many years later his younger brother also got shot for being an asshole what what did this younger brother do now this was is he techni- also arguing this is technically an aside were? so i don't remember his name okay but he was no- he was another district attorney uh-huh. he was very handsome <gasps> And he had a friend who was also very handsome, and they were known as, like, rakes. So they were just these, they were fuck boys. <laughs> they were Regency fuck boys. So they were rakes. They were, I'm like, running rake. around, fucking anything they could, and then... Trying to get all these leads. And then Key's friend got married. Oh, This okay. very pretty lady. Mm-hmm. And Key goes, what a very pretty lady, and starts an affair behind her, his friend's back. And so they're fucking around. Key's friend has no idea until at a party... Somebody slips a note into his pocket. <gasps> An anonymous note slipped into his pocket that describes every little detail about this affair. The note reads, LOL, your wife. She getting that good. She getting that good good. She getting that good good. <laughs> she getting that good good. But her lock has been entered by but it a was key. like no, it was like explicit oh. details. Ooh. 
Do we know of who, everything? Do we know who wrote this? Note? Completely anonymous. <gasps> it was slipped into his inside pocket at a party. It was the other guy. Key? No, no, the guy from before. It was Sherburn. It was Sherburn. It was retired. It was Sherburn's revenge. He knew Sherburn's like, march to the like fifty pocket. at this point. <laughs> But no, uh, and it included all of the signals Key would give to his wife to be like, hey, let's go out today Mm -hmm. when he was walking by his house. And as he was reading it, he was with a friend, not Key, the other guy. And he was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he looks outside and there's Key giving (laughs) a signal to his wife. (laughs) And so he he picks up a gun, runs outside and Key's like, my friend. And he shoots him in the dick. (laughs) My friend, why do you have the, oh, God. And then he stumbles backward and he's like, no, please don't kill me. And then he shoots him in the chest and kills him. <laughs> That's not a duel. To be, no. To be clear. But it would have been had that guy given oh, two no. seconds. It, that's very funny. Just like, oh my God, a note with all the different things my, my friend is doing to attract my wife. Oh no. And all the things that he's done to his wife. Oh God. And they, some people, On it somehow sofa. got into the press oh. and some people published it in their newspapers. To the point where the like various newspaper controlling commissions like were fining newspapers like hundreds of dollars for printing it because it was so lewd. Ugh. Well, but uh, he was the first guy to get out of prison for temporary insanity plea. That makes sense in American history because they were like, "Your wife." He was like, "I just saw red. He was fucking my wife. I killed him. I mean, it was just he was doing my wife, and I had to murder him. And yeah. If I if it had been five, he it was wrong place, wrong time." Because if he'd had 10 minutes, I'm sure he would have been like, I'm going to sue this man to the ground. I'm going to have him beaten. I'll duel him. They were both attorneys. Mm Mm-hmm. That's very funny. But yeah, so Francis Scott Key, uh, his kids, one died in a duel and one died in what could have been a duel, but instead was just straight up murder in the streets. Straight up murder in the streets. Although, I will say, newspapers printing stuff like that. Newspapers were pretty nasty at that time. Mm-hmm. Like, we think, oh, it's so bad now with the CNNs and the Fox Newses and the NBCs. No, no, no. To be clear, people back then were printing absolutely out-of-pocket stuff. Oh, absolutely. I like, think it was... The public hated that guy's wife that was yeah. cheating on him. He, she took the stand and was like, I did everything that a wicked woman would do. And, like, she got exonerated because they were like, you were seduced. Poor it's quiet. fine. Because she was seduced by such a man, an attorney, such a, man. a very handsome single man. Oh. And so she was exonerated from adultery. Oh. And they stayed together. Oh, and the nice public hated it because they all knew through the newspapers. That she had been a dirty little slattern. Yes. And so she died like 20 years later. And that guy remarried to a Spanish like ambassador's daughter. My name is Isabel. I am from Barcelona. And he was like 50 and she was like 20. But that's oh, a whole okay. Other, I'm that's uncomfortable whole with that. Thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was I was going to say? I think it was between like Johnson and Adams. One of the somebody, somebody at one point, I'll do a, I'm sure I'll do some research on this in a bit, but one of the newspapers printed that I th- believe it was like one of them, one of the presidential candidates was a hermaphrodite. That sounds like something they would do. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll research more into that. That'll probably be an episode coming up. It's like what the, one of the earlier presidential races, but yeah, weird presidential story. One of the early presidential races. I know that they released pamphlets. Like, did you know, did you know, uh, like Samuel Adams is a hermaphrodite. He doesn't just like beer. <laughs> uh, anyway. So now we've learned about Francis Scott Key. I do have one last story. It's very silly. Um, and so this is between two Frenchmen, uh, Le Pic and Grand Prix. So uh, this duel is over the affections of one Mademoiselle Tourave, which is a famed ballet dancer for the Paris Opera. Mm. Um, she is a fancy dancy lady. Fancy. She is being kept by Monsieur Grand Prix. Um, and being kept is a, uh, it's a very specific term. It basically means that he was her sugar daddy. Patron or? Kind of. It was a, he was, he took her to dinner. He paid for her apartment. He paid for her to like move to Paris and to become, he was basically her patron, but also they decidedly had a sexual relationship. Ah. So it was definitely more of an arrangement than it was anything. Definitely sugar daddy. Yeah. It was more of an arrangement than anything, but she definitely belonged to him. Yes. Like he was like, I will provide the life for you that you want, but I want the like the um what's the I want basically bragging rights for like being the man who sleeps with the most beautiful ballerina in all the city. Cause I mean the ballet was where people went to come see TV. I mean that yeah. was that was the entertainment of the time. So. Yes, and they were the models, the mm-hmm. 
be pretty ladies. Absolutely. Although I don't understand why ballet is. I mean, I get the ballet is still it's pretty now. It's the butts. Oh my god, ballerinas, men and women, mm-hmm. the best asses, the best booties. Oh, they're the best. So Grand Prix is keeping Mademoiselle Tourave, and he eventually discovers to his extreme displeasure that she is currently sleeping with another person, uh, a young man named Monsieur Le Pic. Oh, she's um, getting it on the side. Yes. Well, obviously, the Grand Prix is like in his 55s, f- late 45s, early 55s. He's kind of older. Le Pic is 25, 30. He's a young. Her age. Yeah, he's like her age. It's very, um, what's the word? It's very Moulin Rouge. Yeah, it's very Moulin Rouge. It's very Moulin Rouge. Uh, so basically, Le P- Grand Prix is, I can't remember the name of that, of the bad Grand Prix is the bad guy here, and Le Pic is Obi Wan Kenobi in this. Um, Christian. Ewan His McGregor. His name was Christian. His name is Christian. The show. Uh, Monsieur Le Pic is going to be Obi Wan Kenobi. So Obi Wan Kenobi has been seen and documented repeatedly with Mademoiselle Tourave, and this is an affront Grand Prix couldn't stand because it doesn't really matter to Grand Prix that much that Tourave is sleeping with someone. It's that people know. Well, yeah, they're going out to dinner like together, and Le Pic is like, "Yes, this is my lady." The Mademoiselle Tourave. You know her, a famous ballet dancer, formerly associated with that crusty old bastard Grand Prix. And so one of the uh, cardinal rules of dueling is that seconds do all the negotiations on behalf of the principals. Um, and this, like I said earlier, this is to try and ease tensions, right? Yeah. You're never going to have a calm conversation with the person you want to murder oh, absolutely not. about how to easily murder each other. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the seconds come together, and they they are encouraged to like get the combatants to cool off to consider apologizing to each other the seconds do not cool things down in this in this case the seconds decided at length that the duel should be as grand and as magnificent as the woman herself what possibly compare what could possibly compare to a ballerina of this stature why a hot air balloon a good cheese (laughs) i shall throw fromage at you until you perish you filthy bastard uh no it, they decided that the grand oh, hot spectac- air balloon, not just one hot air balloon, <gasps> two hot air balloons. So they decided that because Mademoiselle Tirave was such a high level, such an elevated member of society, that the duel needed to be that level of elevated as well. What Super Smash Brothers <laughs> <laughs> items on <laughs> Super items Smash Brothers? On, like. Uh, Kingfield stage is that. Mm-hmm. So the seconds decide that not one, but two identical hot air balloons had to be constructed. They would rise into the air, tethered 80 feet apart, and at a certain height, the duelists would fire at each other. Not at the other person, but at the other massive hot air balloon to try and puncture and sink it. But that's such an easier target. It is a much easier target, which is so stupid. <laughs> So it, it's nearly impossible to miss, but it's so large that they were like, we can't just use regular guns. A regular gun isn't going to make this thing go down as fast as we need it to. What, did they give them cannons? They gave them blunderbusses. Oh, for the love of God. <laughs> if, you know, if you know what a blunderbuss is, um, we were just talking about Smash Brothers. A blunderbuss is what King K. Rule uses. If you don't play Smash Brothers, a blunderbuss is, imagine like a pirate shotgun. It's a shotgun with a big, like, trumpet horn on the end. Yeah, it's like a musket shotgun combo kind of thing. It can fire really, really big musket balls, or it can fire uh, large amounts of, like, buckshot, birdshot kind of thing. Um, it's nearly impossible to miss with a blunderbuss. But it, it's really, it's again, it's like a musket thing, so it's one shot, one kill kind of thing. And if you don't, if you don't hit, you will die. So, armed with their blunderbusses, and followed by the seconds, they arrive a month later to the gardens. Yeah, can you imagine being that angry for a month? Yeah, you'd think they'd get like some post nut clarity at some point. Like, <laughs> be like, we shouldn't fight. Some post nut clarity, some post dual clarity, or like I- they'd have like a-, a really good cheese and be like, you know what, we shouldn't kill each other. <laughs> oh my goodness, this camembert is so good. Why was I going to get into a stupid balloon? <laughs> I should stay here on the ground where and it also, is safe. Why didn't that lady just be like, y'all? This is dumb as hell. I will say this. Every duel I have read about where the person being fought over is like a woman or the person being fought over is any person in general. The one thing that is always missing from those stories is that person's perspective. Oh, absolutely. Because it's not about her. Also, it's women in like the 1600s, 1700s. Mm-hmm. No one cares about a woman. They don't care about her opinions. Um, but I will say, if you wonder, uh, if you are wondering about her opinion, I do have one sentence 
one sentence that I found on her opinion. Oh. She publicly said she would bestow her smile on whomever survived. Just a smile? Just, well... Or is that code? That is the gentle way, that is the gentle way to say, if you win the duel, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little kissy kiss. I'm gonna give you a little kissy kiss, a little smooch I'll get you a little, little thumb thumb. A little smooch That good good. That, <laughs> okay, we're trying to keep this... <laughs> A little smooch, a little smoocheroo, all right? She's going to give them a little smoocheroo if they win. So they arrive a month later to the gardens where the balloons are being inflated. And to be clear, just like the pistols have to be exactly the same and the swords have to be exactly the same, these balloons have been constructed identically. And all these onlookers, all these people wandering through Paris are like, oh my God, look at the hot air balloon, Jacques. There's going to be a hot air balloon race because they haven't put a big sign up that says, hey, warning. We're going to kill each other. <laughs> warning. We're going to try and straight up murder each other. So, Because that's illegal. Yes, because that's illegal. So they get, <laughs> they get into the hot air balloons. The seconds try one last time to try and resolve it. It won't work. The seconds then get into the hot air balloons with them. Mm-hmm. Why? <laughs> because it takes more than one person to run a hot air balloon. But. Uh huh. But, but yeah. Oh no. Yeah. This that means that means waiting. that no matter who wins, two people die. At least two people die. Weird ass double homicide. Mm-hmm. So at exactly nine o'clock, all four of them climbed into their balloons and began their ascent. They climbed higher and higher up above Seven the Seven hours later. <laughs> At hot air balloons, not traditionally fast vehicles. Um, they climb up into the air. They begin their ascent. At 200, no, 20,000 feet. I'm really bad with numbers. There's At, no way in hell they got to 20,000 feet. 22,000 feet? That's more likely. Yep, 2,000 feet. There we go. I'm really bad at number, sir. Let's say 20,000 feet, they would all be like gasping <laughs> for air. That's airplane level. 20,000 feet. The cabins decompress. Uh, no. We're sitting steady at 20,000 feet. You may now shoot the man across <laughs> from you. You may, fire, you may now fire your blunderbuss into the sky. So at 2,000 feet above Paris, um, they cut the ropes that attach the two hot air balloons. They're exactly 80 feet apart. Le Peak aims at the balloon, shoots, and misses. Grand Prix fires right afterwards, punctures Le Peak's balloon, and Le Peak's balloon, so they, were, they had thought at one point, so I know it seems kind of crazy, you're going to get into a hot air balloon, we're going to shoot at it, and then you're just going to plummet to your death. You're just going to die. Straight up die. Well, the idea was that maybe, 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 if it got shot, it would kind of slowly deflate. That's not how those work. Yeah, well, these guys were not balloon people. They were not aeronauts. They were people who enjoyed the company of ballerinas. They were not aeronauts. And so Le Peak is quite unhappy to discover as soon as his balloon is punctured, he and his second plummet 2,000 feet onto the rooftop of a house in Paris, and they are, and I quote, dashed upon it into pieces. Um, Those poor house owners. I know. Can you imagine just, just having <laughs> breakfast and then <laughs> <laughs> just at ten o'clock in the morning, you just find a dead, horny Frenchman that looks like Obi Wan Kenobi on the top of your house, and his friend, and his friend C three PO, C three PO, who is also full dead. So Le Peak and his second were discovered extremely dead in the wreckage of their balloon. Jesus. Grand Prix landed three hours later, victorious, 17 miles outside of Paris. So he Be just went on a ride after that. He was like, we're going to fuck off for a second so that the cops don't get us immediately. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Uh, their hot air balloons don't really just go up and down, right? That's why they had to be tied together. Because as soon as they went up, the wind started to carry them. So they shot at each other, and then he was like, okay, time to come down. And then three hours later, they safely descended 17 miles away. Because you don't have any way of controlling them. You just got to know which way the wind is There's blowing. There's no rudder. There's not a rudder. There's no way to steer it. Um, which is why, Which is why Zeppelins are so funny. Zeppelins? Yeah. Zeppelins. Zep. Zeppelin. Zeppelin. Zep. Are you Dr. Seuss? <laughs> I Zeppelin. Me and my Zeppelin. <laughs> and my... Fine. Dirigibles. Dirigible? I'll Is take that it. a good word? I'll take it. Well, it's just, they, there's a reason why they are not. They were not widely used, because they were very hard to steal. The Hindenburg. The Hindenburg also exploded, um, which was bad for Zeppelin travel. But Zeppelin? Zeppelin. One word. Led Zeppelin? Yep. It's not Led Zeppelin. 
It's also not Lead Zeppelin. I uh, my whole worldview has been rocked. I want you to know that. Really? Mm-hmm. I for years I thought it was Zeppelin. 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 Okay. Led Zeppelin. Never gonna say that word again. Cool. So we'll make you talk about Led Zeppelin for the next three hours. Fantastic. We're not gonna continue on for the next three hours because, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you've enjoyed it, but. That is going to bring us to a close here. I would like to thank so much my special guest for coming along. Kay, did you have a good time? I did. Fantastic. Thank you for coming. Hopefully we'll get you back more on Season 2 of Horrible History with Asher Brooks. Uh, my name is Asher Brooks. If you really enjoyed this, please consider watching some of the other episodes we have. Please consider subscribing to us so you'll know when more episodes are coming up. We have some more fun things coming up. We'll be talking about World War II spies. I obviously have to figure out which one of the presidential candidates called the other one a hermaphrodite. So we got a lot of fun things coming up in the future. And I would just like to say thank you so much for listening. This sound equipment was very expensive. Expensive. So the more you listen, the more this makes it worth it in my wife's eyes. Thank you all so much for listening and goodbye.